Thank you, Miles, and thanks a lot to the organizers for this invitation. Uh, so I will present you some recent results on the approximation properties of tree tensor networks, and also some results on uh, learning strategies using uh, complexity-based uh, model selection techniques. Uh, these works um, have been uh, done with uh, Mazen Ali, who is uh, currently a postdoc in, uh, in Nantes, in my group, and a colleague in Nantes also, Bertrand Michel, who is a professor in statistics. So first, I, I will uh, uh, introduce the approximation tools based on three tensor networks that we have analyzed. And the, the starting point um, is the introduction of so-called tensorization of functions. So I introduced this uh, technique first for a function of a, a single variable. So I have a function defined on an interval 0, 1. The first step is to uh, subdivide uniformly your interval into b to the power l intervals. And uh, any point x on your interval can be identified with two uh, numbers, an integer i, which will locate where your interval x is, in which interval it is, and uh, a local variable y, then you where the point x is uh, within an interval. Then your integer can be represented in base b, so you will have a... a a representation of your integer in base b. So here is an illustration with a binary encoding of your integer. And at the end, after this uh, encoding of your variable x, you end up with an identification of a univariate function with a, a multivariate function, depending on some digits, taking uh, value 0 until b minus 1, and a local variable y taking values in, in 0, 1. This procedure can be easily extended to multivariate function. If you have a function of defined on a hypercube, you proceed in a similar way for every variable by encoding these variables using some digits between zero and b minus one and some uh, local variables y1 to yd. And the, the nice thing with this uh, identification of a function with a higher order tensor is that it is, in fact, a linear isometry between LP spaces, where these LP spaces are equipped with uniform measures, so that any topological properties that you can um, obtain for sets in this tensor space uh, uh, allows you to obtain some results in the initial uh, function spaces you, you were considering. Okay, now uh, to go to approximation, because uh, up to now we have just identified functions in LP with some tensors. To do approximation, we will introduce a, a, a finite dimensional space by considering some subspace of function S of functions of the local variables Y. It gives you uh, a tensor subspace that you could call a tensor feature space. And um, in particular, if you take for S uh, some polynomial space of degree K, what you obtain is in fact a space of multivariate splines of degree k over a uniform partition uh, of your hypercube. And um, here is an illustration of uh, what are the elementary tensors in, in, in this tensor space. By elementary tensors, I mean a function which is a product of function of univariate, uh, uh, of univariate functions, function of uh, the different uh, binary um, integers in base b, in base b equal 2, and uh, a function of the local variable. You have two examples here uh, on the left and the middle of um, uh, piecewise constant functions, and the last one here is an elementary feature uh, where you have a linear dependence in the local variable y. So you can see here that the, with very elementary uh, tensors, uh, you can represent quite um, complicated features uh, in this tensorized setting. Um, wait, I see a question from uh, Joseph. Why RB and not NB? Uh, ah, okay. So the, the variables are in um, the variables are. Uh, taking values between zero and b minus one. But this object that you see here is uh, a function of this integral of this integer. So it is identified with an element of Rb. So at the end, the element here are element of this tense space. I hope I have answered the question. Okay. 
Uh, and now to, to perform some approximation, we will uh, introduce some uh, tree-based or hierarchical tensor formats in this tensor, tensor feature space. So I will consider functions that are rank structured and uh, this rank structure is associated with a certain dimension tree T. We have here uh, an example, which is a hierarchical partitioning of the set of, of variables. And uh, the set is associated with associated ranks, ranks associated with this dimension tree. And uh, an element of this uh, tensor format will admit uh, a multilinear parameterization where the parameters is a collection of uh, low order tensors that form a tree tensor network. So you have here maybe more familiar representation uh, using tensor diagram notations where you see a representation of the function I will consider, uh, which is a, a tree tensor network, each block here being a, a low order tensor. Okay, so uh, we have seen uh, yesterday several times a, a particular example of these tree-based tensor formats. When you choose a linear tree, the resulting format is uh, the tensor train format, and it corresponds in this tensorized setting to the so-called quantized tensor train format, QTT, that has been uh, considered by several authors. Uh, and uh, you have here a schematic representation of uh, the resulting function in this particular case. So we, we have all the ingredients now to define an approximation tool based on tensor networks. So an approximation tool will be a sequence of sets with increasing complexity. These sets are denoted phi n, and these are these functions that can be uh, represented in a tree-based tensor format after tensorization with some resolution L, which is a free parameter, some tuple of ranks, which is also a free parameter, and this set phi n is associated with function with a complexity less than n. So of course, the question is, what is the measure of complexity for a tensor network? And um, depending on the notion of complexity you introduce, you will end up with different approximation tools. So here we introduce a complexity measure, which is uh, defined uh, as a complexity of the corresponding tensor networks. A natural measure of complexity is to count the number of parameters. That means the number of entries in your tensors. But you can also introduce another measure of complexity, which is the number of, of non-zero parameters. If you want to exploit some sparsity of the tensors, and we have seen this uh, notion of sparse tensor networks yesterday on, uh, in some talks. So we have here two different measures of complexity, and that is two different approximation tools that I will indicate with a calligraphic F for full tensor networks or S for sparse tensor networks. You have um, relations between these two complexities, and so you have a, a series of inclusions between these approximation sets that, that have been defined here, and this will be useful to understand the the, the properties, uh, the approximation properties that we will see later. Okay, so now uh, we are in an approximation setting. We want to approximate a function f in some banner space x. So what we can do is define the best approximation error of f in this uh, approximation set phi n that I will denote uh, like this. This best approximation error tells you what you can expect from your approximation tool. So first question is, of course, is uh, does this converge to zero? It's a question of uh, universality of your tool. Also, you may, uh, you, you may ask, uh, is there exist a best approximation for any function f in the space x? The more interesting questions will be, uh, for a certain function class, uh, how fast this error converged to zero. And lastly, and this is what, what I want to, to consider now, I would like to really describe the, or to, to obtain some properties of the sets of functions for which the error behaves in a certain way. Okay, and this is a question of characterizing the approximation classes of these tools. Okay, to, to obtain a characterization of, um, of these um, approximation classes, I first um, tell you here about some properties of the approximation tools that we have been able to show. So first, 
we have that this space, these sets of phi n are in fact cones containing the zero. They have some nestedness property. And also, and most importantly, uh, they are not too nonlinear in the sense that if you had two functions that are in phi n, you will end up with a function in some phi c n, we see a fixed constant, okay? So adding functions of complexity n results in a complexity in O of n. And this is important to, uh, um, to apply some classical results from approximation theory. In the particular case, when you uh, are in, in, in the space x equal to LP, so you me measure error in, in LP norm, uh, what we can prove is that the union of the phi n is dense in LP. So this is a universality result for this tool. And uh, for any f in LP, there exists the best approximation in phi n. So all these properties allow to exploit classical machinery of approximation theory, and in particular to obtain results on the approximation classes of, of tensor networks. So. For an approximation tool, here I recall the definition of an approximation class. For a given alpha, a real number, you define this set A alpha infinite as a set of all functions for which your tool will give you a convergence in n minus alpha, okay, with a rate of convergence alpha. The properties P1 to P4 of the tool imply that, in fact, these spaces uh, are linear spaces. More precisely, they are quasi-banner spaces with a quasi sum norm, which is given here, and which is in fact defined as the minimal constant such that this inequality holds. I have introduced two measures of complexity. So depending on the complexity measure you choose full or sparse, you will obtain different approximation spaces. But because there are some these, these inclusions between the approximation sets phi n, you have uh, a series of embeddings between these uh, approximation classes. Okay, now uh, we'd like to understand what are the functions in these approximation uh, classes. So a first result here gives you an embedding result of best of spaces in the approximation classes of full tensor networks. More precisely, we have that these there's off spaces B alpha infinite LP, where the, the regularity is measured with respect to the LP norm, are embedded in this class with a rate of convergence alpha tilde over D with an arbitrary alpha tilde arbitrarily close to, to alpha. So you may recognize here um, an optimal performance or near to optimal performance, which is known to be alpha over D. And this optimal performance is reached for any alpha without needing to adapt the tool to the regularity. This is an interesting feature of these uh, approximation tools. And for this, uh, for capturing this extra regularity automatically, the depth or resolution of the network is really crucial. Okay, this was for a uh, base of spaces where regularity is measured in LP. Uh, there are known linear approximation tools that, uh, that perform in an optimal way also. So now we move to a more uh, difficult uh, case where uh, you consider function in base of spaces where the regularity is measured in an in a L2 norm, which is weaker than uh, LP. So we know that non some nonlinear approximation tool uh, allow to, to achieve an optimal performance for for these um, uh, function spaces. And this is also the case for these uh, three tensor networks where we can prove an embedding result for these uh, beds of spaces uh, above the critical embedding line. Uh, but here the embedding with an, uh, uh, here, uh, an approximation class with an optimal rate is for sparse tensor networks. Here sparsity will be uh, required in order to achieve these optimal rates. If you use full tensor networks, you will obtain also a good performance, with, but with a, a slightly deteriorated, deteriorated rate. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, for these base of spaces, you can see that you, we have a tool which is quite generic. Without adapting the tool, we will uh, achieve a near to optimal performance for a, a wide range of, um, of base of spaces. Uh, 
some word on high dimensional ap approximation. Uh, what we were able to prove also is that uh, if you have some mixed dominating smoothness, which is a typical space encountered in, um, in high dimensional uh, applications, we also achieve a near to optimal performance with these two. And this is also the case for anisotropic smoothness, uh, where here the, uh, the, the anisotropic smoothness, is, is, uh, the optimal rate, sorry, is minus s over d, where s is some aggre aggregated smoothness. So we have this optimal performance for these uh, uh, sets that allows us to, to, to show that also for i-dimensional uh, approximation, these tools are, are, are well suited. Uh, an interesting result is the following, is that in, so what we have seen before is that classical beds of spaces uh, are embedded in these approximation uh, spaces. But here we have uh, another result that tells us that an approximation space is not included in any beds of space of any regularity. And this tells us that uh, approximation spaces of, of these tools contain functions that are not described in terms of classical smoothness. Okay, so this is a good point in the sense that tensor networks may be useful for applications where functions does not have a, a classical regularity. So the, it allows, potentially allows to go beyond classical uh, regularity of smoothness classes. Okay, so now um, that we have these uh, approximation results in hand, I would like to, to show you uh, a strategy for uh, learning tree tensor networks in a classical statistical setting. So in statistical learning, there are two typical tasks that we consider here. The first task is the approximation of a random variable y as a function of random variables x1 to xd from samples of the pair xy classical setting in supervised learning. But also, a second task is to approximate the probability distribution of a random variable x or random vector x using samples from the, the distribution. And for these two tasks, a, a classical approach is to introduce a risk functional whose minimizer over the set of functions is your target function. And such that the difference between the risk of a function f and the risk of the target gives you some distance between uh, the two functions. In practice, the risk is uh, usually defined as an expectation, expectation of some contrast of, or loss function, depending on the function f and uh, the variable z, which can be either x in unsupervised learning or, or the pair x, x, y in supervised learning. And here I recall you two classical settings, uh, the least square regression setting, where you, you, you use a square loss for the contrast function and end up with an excess risk, which is no more than the square of the L2 distance between the function f and the target function. And for uh, density estimation problems, uh, using a L2 loss, you also have an excess risk that will uh, be the squared L2 distance between the target and the function f, the target being the probability density of uh, the random variable x with respect to a certain reference measure. Now I come with uh, the practice. In practice, what you have is uh, a set of samples of your variable z, and you will construct an approximation of your target function by minimizing an estimation of the risk or called empirical risk over a certain uh, approximation set or model class M. So usually we, 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 we have this splitting of, uh, of the error. The error will be decomposed into two pieces. First, an approximation error that tells you the best you can expect from your uh, model class M and an estimation error which is due to the fact that you have a limited number of information, limited number of samples. So it is clear that when you increase the complexity of your model class, you will, in practice, decrease the approximation error. But because you have a limited number of information, usually you will observe also an increase of the estimation error. So th the game will be to uh, select a good model class that um, 
take the best from the available information by balancing these two, uh, these two errors. So more precisely, what we will, what we will do with three tensor networks is consider an approximation tool, which is made of a collection of three tensor networks associated with different resolutions, different trees, different ranks, and possibly different sparsity patterns if you consider sparse uh, tensor networks. And we will use here a, a model selection approach uh, a la Baron Birger Massard, which consists in selecting among all these uh, uh, models that we have, among all these tensor networks, the one that minimizes a, a penalized empirical risk. So we will minimize over all possible models the empirical risk associated with the best estimator in this particular model M, plus a penalty functional, which, is depend, which will depend on the complexity of the model class. So the question is how to, 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 to de devise a good penalty functional in order to, to, to obtain good rates of convergence for the selected selected models. So the first step for this is to derive a, an upper bound of the metric entropy of the set of, of tensors MM, where here we consider tensor networks with bounded parameters. What we obtain quite easily is a, a bound of the metric entropy at scale epsilon, which is upper bounded by something linear in the complexity of the model as a full or sparse complexity, depending on what you consider as a tensor network. And uh, so it, essentially you have here uh, uh, a behavior of the metric entropy, which looks like balls in, uh, in Euclidean spaces. Okay. It looks like a linear approximation too. So from this and by adapting results of Kolchinsky, we have been able to prove uh, an oracle inequality uh, of this type, which, is, which gives you here an expectation that the error is upper bounded by the best you can expect over the collection of your models. But this result is obtained with a particular format penalty that has been uh, derived from this uh, complexity estimates of the, of the tensor network. So you have here a penalty shape that depends uh, up to log factor linearly in the, in the complexity. And uh, here um, uh, it depends on the inverse of the number of samples. And here you have a term logarithm of a certain number that characterize the richness of your uh, collection of tensor networks. This number NCM is the number of possible models with complexity C. So this characterize, this term here characterize the richness of the collection of models. And what we were able to prove is that for the collection of all possible tensor networks, as of full or sparse, with or without variable trees, you have that this log of NC is upper bounded by C log C. And this allows, to obtain, this allows us to obtain an oracle inequality of this form, which is now uh, where you see an upper bound here explicitly uh, um, depending on the complexity of your model and uh, the number of samples. And from this, we will derive a, a series of results. In particular, a general result is that if you, if you tell me that the target function is in the approximation class A alpha infinite of your tool, then you easily derive from this oracle inequality a rate of convergence, which is here um, expressed as a function of, of the number of samples. So to be more concrete now, I can consider function uh, in beds of spaces this will be a particular, uh, a particular class of applications where you know that for, for base of spaces, uh, BS, uh, QL2, where uh, the regularity is measured in L2, the minimax rates are known to be of this form uh, in 2S divided by 2S plus D. And these are achieved by linear estimators. When you go to much harder uh, base of spaces with a regularity measured in L tau, tau less than two, uh, optimal rates are the same, but they are achieved with nonlinear estimators. And when you apply the previous results, which are the approximation results and the oracle inequalities we have derived, what you obtain is that three tensor networks with this particular uh, model selection strategy achieve 
are arbitrarily close to optimal uh, rates, like this, with the S tilde arbitrarily close to S. And this is achieved with full tensor networks for this uh, linear estimation setting, or with sparse tensor networks in, in the much, much more difficult case uh, where regularity is measured in, in L tau. So interesting point here is that for this whole range of base of spaces, the proposed strategy is minimax adaptive to the regularity. That means you don't have to adapt the tool to the regularity of the target. Uh, and uh, okay, here I have mentioned the result for base of spaces, but you can you can uh, derive also a rate of convergence for other types of smoothness, mixed dominating or anisotropic. And we are also able to prove that uh, minimax or arbitrarily close to minimax rates are achieved for this um, type of smoothness also using sparse tensor networks. Sparsity is here in, important uh, for exploiting this uh, anisotropic smoothness. Um, Miles, I don't know how much time do I have? Can you tell me? Three more minutes until you get into your question time. OK. Uh, so now a, a few words. Um, so this was for the theoretical side. So of course, when you go to the practice, you have to make some sacrifice. <laughs> the first is that the form of the penalty as a function of the complexity and the number of samples is a correct form. But the constants in the definition of this penalty are not computable. Okay, so in practice, what we use is a, a classical strategy called the slope heuristics, where we define a penalty functional proportional to complexity divided by n with a lambda that will be selected with this particular uh, heuristics. And it works quite well in practice and allows, uh, here you see an example, I don't go into the detail of this figure, but uh, for this particular case, we are able to select among all possible models, uh, where here in the x axis you have the complexity of the models, here you have the generalization error of the estimator, and the red point here, which is in fact the, the best uh, possible model, has been selected by the strategy here. Uh, also, uh, here we, we consider with these approximation tools, models with viable trees, viable ranks. And of course, in high dimension, it's impossible to explore all possibilities. It is a com of combinatorial complexity. So in practice, we rely on um, adaptive algorithm with suitable exploration strategy. And you can find them in these two references where we will construct a sequence of, of good models, let's say, and the final procedure will select in this subset of models uh, 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 an optimal one. Another point uh, in the practice is that the theoretical results I have, I have shown relies on the assumption that you are able to find a minimizer of the empirical risk, which is known to be uh, not uh, uh, achievable with available algorithms, okay? Available algorithms today for minimizing empirical risk over these uh, uh, tree tensor networks uh, do not guarantee to find a minimizer of the empirical risk. So there is still a gap from the theory to the practice. Also, the adaptive algorithms we use seems to perform quite well. Uh, we really need to, to, to fill the gap between theory and practice to, to, to be able to design uh, optimization algorithms that, that leads to the minimizer of the empirical risk. And as a final comment, this is my, my last slide, um, I would like to comment on the choice of tree or in other terms of the architecture of the, of the tensor network. For classical smoothness uh, classes, like based off uh, anisotropic mixed dominating smoothness, the optimal rates and the minimax results I have, uh, I have shown uh, have been obtained with fixed linear trees or the tensor train format. But we can also show that these results hold for any fixed binary tree with a suitable ordering of the variables. But now when you go to the practice, uh, you observe in many applications that a much better performance can be, can be observed when you adapt the tree to the target function. 
so this is illustrated in the paper I, I mentioned, when you can see numerical results where we have strategy for tree exploration. So it has the question, what are the property of an approximation tool with a viable tree? Okay, where the tree is now a free parameter. You can do things in practice, try to adapt the tree and so on, but the question from a theoretical point of view would be to characterize how much nonlinear is this set? We know that this set is highly nonlinear and does not allow to apply classical machinery of approximation theory. Also, we know that the power of approximation is much higher than the fixed tree strategy or fixed tree approximation too, but we would like to quantify how much higher this approximation power is. Here are some uh, references associated with uh, what I um, uh, show you today. And uh, also two, uh, two links to um, available software where you can see the, method, the methods uh, presented, uh, implemented with some uh, tutorials in uh, approximation and learning. And with this, I, I thank you.